This is a demonstration of Dick Schaup's Super Paint made at Xerox Park in the mid 70s. It begins with a spoof on the classic color bars where Dick takes one of the, bar, one of the bars and makes a paintbrush out of it and then cycle paints, which is one of the clever things he could do with Super Paint. You'll see more of this in the demonstration. We start with a monochrome image of the Super Paint workspace with a picture of Dick Schaup himself being cross dissolved into the chair there. And then we cut to a color version of the same scene. You can see Dick is holding a tablet with a stylus on it in his lap. We zoom past the text monitor on the right into the color monitor, showing the first color pixels in the world. These were 8-bit pixels, but he used 4 bits for the menu. You're looking at the menu screen of Super Paint. He's pointing now at the color palette and the brush palette, and the red arrows show you the current color and the current brush. Now we're in the canvas. He got to the canvas by simply clicking off the tablet. He toggles back and forth that way. He just toggled back to the menu and back to the canvas. And he's simply painting a stroke on the tablet with the stylus using the current brush and the current color. He's just changed the color to a green and a chosen a large paintbrush and voila leaves. Back to the menu, Dick chooses a horizontal brush, just a horizontal line. Back in the canvas, he paints a stroke using the current color. Now he chooses another brush. It's called a cluster brush. It does not use the current color. It just uses the color stored in the brush originally. Painting is just laying down copies of a brush along the stylus-defined path. Now he selected the white, which being the background color, when you paint, you get the you get erasure. Now he's chosen the green color pot and a small brush, and he's painting a clump of grass. He chooses the make brush icon and selects that area of the screen. Use the corner cursor to define that section of the screen and define an origin for that brush. Put it in the brush menu. Now he has a new brush, which is a clump of grass. And he paints with that clump of grass. Painting, as you can see, is just copying the current brush as fast as possible into the canvas memory along the path defined by the stylus on the tablet. Dick is pointing out the current color, and he's going up to the HSV color sliders. This is something I added to the program. If you move the value or brightness slider down, the current color, which is that green, gets darker. You can see it going toward black and back up toward full green as he varies the value or brightness. The middle slider is the saturation slider. As you move it down, the color desaturates, so the green becomes tints of green. And at the last, the top slider, of course, is hue, which changes the hue. And you can see since he redefined green to be that red, everything that's green in the canvas is now that red. He converts that green back, that uh, current color back to green, and voila, we're back to green in the canvas. Now here's a scene that was not part of the original Super Paint where the menu is superimposed on the canvas. There's no, it's certainly possible because all, all of the eight bits in Dick's memory were visible to the video, but he didn't usually use it that way. He's showing selection of the current background color and resetting its color with the HSV sliders, and you can see the background change as he does it. I think he's going to reset it to white now. Yes. Chooses the clear screen icon and clears the entire canvas to that current color of white. Selects a yellow color with a large circular brush and paints 
a sun in the canvas. Now he's going to select a menu item, which is draw straight lines, that one. And he will draw straight lines in the canvas, forming a star shape around the sun, let's call it. Dick will go to the menu again and select the color fill icon and fill with it and he also chose the yellow color when he touched inside the star that star area filled with the color current color now he chooses the blue color and a small round brush and draws a cartoon car or paints I should say paints a cartoon car into the canvas Because he's only using four bits for the canvas, there are 16 available colors. Now, this is something Dick is going to do that is, shows off his super paint quite well. It's called cycle paint. You'll recall the cycling color bars at the beginning of this tape. He paints in a succession of pixel values, which take on the succession of colors. And then he chooses the cycle color icon, which makes that set of colors cycle. And he can control the speed and the direction of the cycling from the tablet using the stylus. This was very easy to do in 1974, despite how slow the computers were at the time, because it was just a remapping of a color table lookup. A second wheel. Now he selects a horizontal brush. He's still in cycle paint, cycle color mode, and he paints a highway moving underneath the car. So this is very early animation from an 8-bit frame buffer, some of the earliest color animation in the digital world. Dick is saving that part of the screen with the green square in perspective. And he's copying it, actually. He's, he defined what he was going to copy and where he was going to copy to. Now he's going to clear an area defined by these cursors. And he's turned on cycle color again, and I think you might guess what's going to happen. The tubes seem to flow between the blocks and the block diagram. Chose a purple, he chooses a purple color. And he's using cycle paint again to draw arcs of cycling colors from small green squares to the large green square. Also cycling. Now he chooses the camera icon. This brings in real-world imagery directly into the frame buffer of a sign that happened to be hanging on the wall. Now he's going to cut out that pointing finger and make a brush out of it. He's put it in the menu you can already see. Now he's going to restore that image to the canvas, chooses the purple, chooses the color fill, touches inside the hand, which then proceeds to fill with the current color. He chooses the background color, the color fill, touches inside the gray square, which then fills to the background color. He's choosing the reduce size icon, which he'll take that area of the canvas and reduce it by half and place it where he dictates. Now he's defining it as a paintbrush, placing it into the paintbrush menu, making it the current brush, clearing an area to the background color, 
Dixpree loaded the frame, the canvas area, with several copies of a bouncing ball in different colors. They happen to be chosen cyclically. He's setting those cyclic colors all to white, except for one, which is purple. Now he chooses cycle colors, and the effect is a classic bouncing ball, complete with squash at the very bottom where it impacts and also at the finger where it hits the finger. Now he takes one of those colors in that cycle and sets it to green. And when we go back to the canvas and cycle, we have two bouncing balls. You can control the speed and direction of the cycle, as I indicated earlier, from the uh, tablet using the stylus. Now this is full 256 colors or 8 bits on display, so this is not super paint. This is a color array that I wrote actually. And this is an unusual um, version of super paint where the color, current colors are across the top, the current brushes are down the side, and the canvas area is in the same screen. But there are t I believe there are full 8 bits of colors showing here, so when he paints with the big brush, you get some unusual effects when you cross one color with another. Sometimes it goes under, sometimes it goes over, and sometimes, as in the case of the gray bar, you get, I would call it, undefined color results. Dick is going to paint a, a curving stroke across this array of horizontal and vertical bars that he's painted. And you can see, once again, this strange color mixture that happens in the restrained color space of an 8-bit frame buffer, which has 256 colors maximum possible. This is a canvas scene where Dick has restored a picture of a box in perspective with holes cut in it, and also restored several copies of a painting of a clock uh, at several sizes. And now he's cycling the color map, which makes the second hand appear to, to circle to cycle, and he uses the same cycling trick to have an animated man jump over the box. This sequence, is a sh this is again not super paint, but it's using super paint, it's using the color frame buffer that Dick built in an official demonstration of how a, a laser, laser printer worked at Xerox. The laser's on the right. The uh, cylinder in the middle of the screen is the horizontal deflection of the laser. The cylinder at the lower left is the other direction. This was animated by Eric Martin, an animator from visiting from Harvard in 1974. I was also there at the same time, although I did not take part in making this particular animation. So the X is coming in as a series of dots at the upper right and being written out by the scanning laser onto the drum at the bottom left. Now here's a delightful animation done by Eric Martin as part of his visit. As I said, Eric was a trained animator and this was a, an animation hand painted with Dick's super paint. Uh, of course it's the classic bouncing ball, but it's a lovely, juicy, floppy, bouncing ball. Especially note the squash and stretch when it hits the bottom. And also the shadows he painted in, notice. This has got to be the first piece of animation done by a professional animator in digital graphics. Now this cruder animation was done by myself. I was learning the walk cycle from Preston Blair's Dollar and a Half How to Animate book and I made everything walk. I had a pirate that walked and the vegetables that walked. I was working with an artist named David DeFrancisco in the city and he scanned it himself and I made that walk. Then I programmed in this color cube and made it walk. 
This bald-headed man animation is another piece I did then as part of a tape called Vidbits, which I made in 1974, so that helps date this, this piece. People thought this was hilariously funny in 1974. This is the opening of Vidbits made in 1974 with Gustav Holtz Planets as the music. Now Dick uses his by now familiar cycle paint to paint a ribbon of color and give Xerox their credit. This however is not the last thing on the tape. There are two more rather astonishing things on this tape I found. They are, I believe, the first use of full anti-aliasing of, of uh, Ge geometric uh, lines and curves in raster graphics. First you'll see a set of four almost horizontal lines with and without anti-aliasing. At the top is the jagged stair-stepped lines as normally seen before anti-aliasing and at the bottom you see Dick's solution which is beautiful. He did this in 1972 where it's generally thought that anti-aliasing and raster graphics began in 1974-75. The next picture he shows is an even more, it's a wagon, we call it the wagon wheel. It's two circles, geometric circles connected by spokes. It's a real difficult picture to do with, without aliasing. And he's zooming in on it to show you the anti-aliasing, which appears to be small ramps of gray along the edges. And this shot, of the rays shows you how, no matter what the angle is, the anti-aliasing works. And that brings to the close this videotape made by Dick Shop showing off his Super Paint program and hardware in 1974, probably. <laughs>